So when I asked our speaker how he'd like to be introduced, he requested that I didn't use anything from the internet. The problem is that since recently, he was named as one of CNN's one to watch. There's very little that you can't find out about him on the internet, so I had to ignore that. So he has flown all the way here from Amsterdam, where his office is based, and uh, he also has another office based in Lagos in Nigeria, which is where he's from. So he studied and worked in Nigeria before heading to the Netherlands, where he spent a decade working with OMA's Rem Coolhouse. After that, he set up his own practice, uh, which focuses on architecture for developing countries. Uh, he has become quite well known recently for some of his key work that's addressing the big issue, climate change. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Kunle Adeyemi. Thank you very much, Joe, um, for that very precise introduction. <laughs> um, wow, everyone's here. It's uh, impressive. It's 9, 9 a.m. I, I was actually very worried I won't make it. The only reason I made it is because it's actually 9 p.m. in the Netherlands. So, uh, but uh, yeah, everyone, it's impressive. It's a very, very large crowd here, and everyone looks absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you know, I, I'm going to just quickly take one. There you go. Sorry. Let's do one. All right. I promise no, no Facebook, so no worries. Um, so uh, I, um, I'm here to share my experience with you. And uh, you know, I've, I've uh, been fortunate to have a very varied um, experience, a number of experiences in different parts of the world. And um, I think ultimately, for me, the most important thing is about people. And um, I've had the opportunity to explore that through um, architecture. And, um, but today, I think, uh, the, the most important, one of the key issues that we're dealing with uh, in architecture or globally um, is the point of concern. Um, we are actually faced with two of the most important challenges of our time. Um, and I think there are also opportunities for us to begin to think about um, our world differently uh, and perhaps reconsider how we live in this environment very differently. This is a, an image of uh, New York, as you know, um, taken by a great photographer, a friend of mine, Iwan Ban, who some of you may know. And uh, it's, you know, New York is this archetypical uh, city that represents urbanization and a great city. This is what mankind, humanity, has been able to achieve. Uh, and um, but urbanization is actually one of the greatest challenges of our time. And that has different impacts uh, in different environments from issues of poverty to uh, housing shortages to economic uh, um, disparity and uh, so on and so forth. The other important challenge that we are faced today is climate change. And this is again a picture of New York, the same image taken by Iwan. Uh, and here you see uh, half of it shut down. Um, the power cut off after the Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Uh, and you know, people that lived through that day, of course, um, speak a, about the, the fact that you know, um, suddenly technology, everything you imagined of um, a civilized or a developed city um, coming complete to a complete standstill. So it was a shocking moment, I would say, for perhaps in, 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 on the issue of urbanization, where the environment takes over this, um, 
this victory that we think we have created as uh, human beings over our environment. Um, before I go on, very quick introduction. My uh, practice is called NLE, uh, NLE for short. Um, and we are an architecture, design, and urbanism practice uh, focused on developing cities and communities. And by that, I mean uh, we're actually interested in developing cities as a region and also really interested in developing cities as a, as a process. So um, I tell people, you know, although we've done some um, social uh, work, we're not really a charity organization. You know, we uh, actually like to be profitable, so um, we're business practice, but with a social and environmental consciousness. And I think that, that mixture, sometimes people think is, is, it's not possible, so um, that's, that's my real focus. And lay means at home, uh, and that's because I believe the home is the fundamental building block of any society. And um, before I uh, started in lay, I had worked at Rem Kohlhaas' office uh, at OMA for several years, as Joe mentioned, and I had this great opportunity to you know, work on really amazing projects where there were you know, different kinds of uh, constraints, different kinds of uh, issues, you know, experimented, worked with really amazing uh, uh, people, large-scale projects, and um, in 2010, I uh, the hunger for new challenges led me to uh, seek a new path and start, I started in Lay. Uh, we do a lot of, um, you know, non, um, well, all, all kinds of work, commercial, residential, corporate, uh, and again with uh, a certain level of interest in uh, issues of social and environmental uh, responsibility. And, uh, but I think more importantly is that I'm here today because of uh, uh, one of my works, or two of my works perhaps, uh, which has uh, gotten quite a lot of recognition internationally. And it's uh, ironically the smallest thing I've done in the last uh, 10 years. Um, so the floating school is one which I'm gonna show you later. And uh, Chikoko Radio in, in Potakot is another project. So these are two projects I'll be showing you. Um, I am uh, quite inspired by uh, the quote from Sergio Ferriardo, I think um, is how it's pronounced, the former mayor of Medellin, and I'm sure um, our next speaker, Anna, would, would uh, shed more light on Colombia. He said, you know, our most beautiful buildings must be in our poorest community, in our poorest areas. I mean, I think that is such a visionary statement, you know, that uh, most beautiful buildings must be in our poorest areas. And that really is an idea that you can use architecture, you can use uh, um, uh, development, you can transform an environment by simply inserting um, an object or uh, an intervention within that environment. So it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful statement and I'm quite motivated by that. Going back to the issues of urbanization, we're very, a lot of people know now that, uh, you know, in a few years, I mean, most, more than half the world's population lives in cities. Only uh, in 1950, less than 40% lived in cities. And uh, it's projected that by 2050, 2050, nearly 70% of the world population will live in cities. Um, an interesting point to note there is that the agglomeration of that population will be happening in parts of Asia and uh, uh, mainly Africa. Um, a very known fact, 70% of, of the earth is covered by water. Everyone, you know, you learn that in first grade. So, you know, we began looking into that. Uh, okay, well, this is, this is interesting. So we only actually have 30% land mass. That's what we're dealing with here. Uh, and we began doing some research and, you know, realized that actually 70%, again, nearly 70% of the world capital cities are actually also by water. So that's a bit more of an interesting fact. And, um, but that's not surprising because, of course, 
most cities are settled around water historically. And uh, the Fertile Crescent, which is said to be the cradle of civilization, um, is settled around water um, because it's source of trans uh, agriculture, food, um, and uh, transportation, which is um, important. Um, and then a more interesting fact that we, re we also came across was that 70% of African capital cities uh, are by water. Um, at this point, um, I, I, was, I started thinking, some, I, I, I was thinking we should, I should probably write a book um, the, on the 70% the, um, um, architecture, you know. Um, now, climate change in Africa. Now, although it's said that, the, that Africa is the least responsible for climate change, it is actually said to be the most affected by it, with a large portion of it within the high to extreme high risk zones. Um, so you have these regions, these dark regions showing up here. And of course, climate change, everyone talks about it, you know, CO2 emissions, and it sounds very abstract and all of that. But the most important um, uh, impact to everyday people is, um, is flooding. Yes, so um, this is a scene, this is a, a picture from Lagos in 2011, where, you know, uh, on one hand, you see, uh, uh, you know, people kind of struggling to get out of the flood, uh, just a regular street in, in the city. Uh, and on the other hand, these guys uh, think they're driving a submarine. Uh, but, um, but then you, then, you know, in the same instance, you find this condition where these guys have actually um, taken the situation into their own hands and uh, turned what seems to be a crisis into an opportunity. Uh, and they've become inventive, they've become creative about that situation. So this image for me is a very important image, the power of people, the power of adaptation, resilience, uh, and particularly in the African context where uh, my interest is currently focused uh, the, I see that people have there's so much intellectual capital, there's so much resource, there's so much human capital within people. And all you just need to do is understand how people work, understand what people do, and uh, the answers are within uh, that. So uh, on, that, on the back of that, we, I launched um, the, what I call the African Water Cities Project, which is really the intersection point of the issues of urbanization, rapid urbanization, and climate change. Um, you know, coming to New Zealand, it's the first time uh, I, um, I've been here, and uh, it's really an honor to have been pulled uh, all the way from Lagos, then Amsterdam, and then here. It's, it's, uh, it's been a long journey, but well worth it. So, I, you know, we did very basic research trying to understand um, the environment, and of course, New Zealand is such a rich uh, country, and Auckland with the population of about 1.5 million people. Uh, and we, you know, we did, we, we started looking at the early traditions around water, and of course, the Maori tradition um, has some history um, and, and um, in, you know, embedded in the culture of water. And, um, I'm sure you, all, you probably know this more than I do, so I will not, I would, I'm actually asking for more intelligence uh, later, but these are some of the uh, information that we were able to gather very quickly. Uh, and of course, that some of the early settlements uh, traditionally were also around uh, water. Um, and that uh, there, is, there are also signs of the impact of climate change in New Zealand, and uh, uh, and the, the phenomenon of of the issue of islands uh, disappearing is also uh, perhaps uh, quite topical. Um, so back to uh, Africa, where we began doing some research to understand the context. Um, we began mapping the the territory, looking at things like the GDP growth rates 
looking at all the uh, indices, mapping that against the patterns of, fl of flooding all across the country. And in 2011, um, I, uh, we, we identified 20 potential cities in Africa. And uh, today we've researched three of those, Dar es Salaam, Luanda, and Lagos. But these are cities that are by water and also rapidly uh, urbanizing and they should be the like, focus of development in the next uh, years. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many people here have been to Africa or how many people here are Africans, um, but you know, a lot of impression of Africa is that it's, you know, it's a wild jungle. Um, I, uh, I think some of that is true, <laughs> but a lot of, that is also not um, entirely correct. I mean, there are amazing cities, developed cities all over Africa. Um, of course, Cape Town is well known, the important cities on the coast. Uh, Dakar, Senegal, um, also an amazing city by the coast. Um, Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Angola, in Luanda, in, in Luanda in Angola, also a city by water. Uh, Dar es Salaam, amazing, and of course, Lagos uh, in Nigeria. All these cities are extremely developed uh, in certain ways and also still have challenges uh, of urbanization and climate change. Now, it, it's, it's very interesting because only a few years ago, this is an image, I think, from 2000 and, uh, probably 2010 or 2001, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't quite remember, um, of the Economist, uh, Eco Economist uh, magazine saying the hopeless continent, describing Africa as a hopeless continent. And less than 10 years later, and more currently, this is the position of the same magazine that Africa is rising. And that is really the condition, that's really the situ situation that we are faced right now where there's an uh, immediate change and there's a lot of uh, uh, um, enthusiasm in the growth of the con on the continent. So last year, uh, last year, for last fall, I took a I took a um, I taught a studio at Cornell uh, called Water and the City, which is a research-based and design-based studio, where we b really began exploring the relationship between water and the city. And um, the the idea the the question was, we're trying to understand what really, why is Africa, why are African countries, African cities developing so rapidly, you know? Where, uh, what, what's driving the economy? You know, what, where's the money coming from? Who is investing in it? Where's it going? Uh, and I mean, completely thinking uh, out, outside the box. It's not, a, it's not really about just design anymore, but we really want to understand what are the drivers of development on the continent. And, um, I think, uh, so we, we identified seven uh, what we call decima factors of development, and I'll take you through them uh, and the students that were involved. Uh, the first is, of course, D, demographics. Um, unfortunately, it's not design. Um, and uh, with this, we, the second, economics. Uh, third, social politics. Th uh, fourth, infrastructure morphology, environment, and resources. So um, demographics, really everything starts with people. Everything uh, and ultimately probably ends with uh, people. It's about life, it's about death, it's about growth, it's about population, trends, trying to map. We mapped on every continent, of every country, every city, the growth rates, uh, looked at how slums have uh, emerged, where they are emerging on the continent, uh, looked at major causes of death, diseases. Uh, one would think it's malaria, but actually malaria is uh, somewhere down on the line there. Uh, but you know, malaria, what's also interesting about that is that of course the source, the issue of malaria is also tied to the issue of water because that's a breeding ground. So it's not a medical, it's not a, it's, not a, uh, it's, it's, it's actually an environmental problem, you know. If you want to deal with malaria, you actually think about the environment, think about their sources of, uh, of breeding. 
and uh, a, a country like Singapore has, has uh, uh, dealt with that issue. E e e economics, um, where's the money coming from? Where, where's it going? Who is investing? Of course, China um, is investing everywhere in the world now. What's, you know, where, what are they doing with the money? Uh, what kind of projects are they investing in, hotels, uh, things like that. Uh, social politics, uh, looked, we looked at the history, the patterns the, of, of development. Uh, we looked at uh, politics, the cycles of uh, political uh, trends, you know, and, and how that has an impact on, also de on, on development. Uh, we looked at conflict areas. Um, infrastructure, where is money being invested into communications? We've seen how communication has, uh, how the uh, GSM phones or the cellular phones has frog, helped to frog leap the continent. Um, water uh, as, as uh, infrastructure, the sources of water, how to get water. Uh, morphology, of course, the shape, the territory, the landscape of an environment has an impact on its development. Um, the topography, the um, density, uh, clusters, um, and then, of course, uh, the environment. Now, in the environment, we, you know, we, we also discovered a number of interesting patterns uh, emerging. Uh, and some of it actually is that there's, there's a, a shift in the Due to sort of uh, due to global warming, there's now a sh we're noticing a shift, a south a southeast shift in the um, uh, um, environmental uh, pattern uh, of on the continent. So we're going to getting a lot more rainfall, a lot more activities around the east eastern part of uh, Africa, Tanzania, uh, and all of, all of those uh, areas. And uh, lastly, resources. So um, resources, oil. Um, uh, gold, how, wh what people are coming to get, what, are, what they are taking out, what, these are issues that actually drive development. And of course, water is an important resource. It it's really is the uh, source of life in a, in a way. So uh, in a way, de the decima factors are really um, the, the, th the um, idea for the African Water Cities project. And um, if you really break it down, the first letters are issues of uh, rapid urbanization, and the uh, third are issues around the environment, climate change, uh, etc. And so, you know, it's again the drivers of development is not necessarily design. Design, you know, only is is only a tool. So it's it's funny that sometimes we we get hung up on the fact that. Um, you know, we focus so much on design, and as, and as, as architects of um, today or, or architects thinking about tomorrow, we really need to start to think differently. We need to start to um, understand the dynamics, the e e e ecology that affects developments. And that's really what our role will be. And using design as a tool to orchestrate all these issues. So, um, I mean, it's, you, you, a lot of us get upset that oh, a project just stopped and uh, because you know, there's no funding and nobody, you actually don't even know the cost of your project. You, know, you don't know who's going to pay for it. You, you really don't care. You don't understand that dynamic. You don't understand, um, or we don't understand what, what kind of resources, the local materials available, or what we're uh, building with. Uh, we don't understand. There's so many things that are, I think, it's, uh, architecture needs to be a lot more of a multidisciplinary approach, and we have to evolve uh, in a way to think outside uh, the box while using design as a tool to reorganize these issues uh, um, effectively. Um, so the result of the research is a book that we're yet to publish uh, called Water and the City Book, and. Um, and it's an elaborate, you know, almost a 250-page document that ends up with this uh, ranking of African, African countries, you know, in, for different categories. And um, it's interesting that, of course, a country like Nigeria has the uh, highest GDP, um, uh, but uh, a, a small country like Equatorial Guinea has the highest GDP per capita growth. So, you know, until then, if I had been invited to Equatorial Guinea, I would not have gone. Um, but now, um, it's, it's totally showing up on the map. 
Um, so I'll get to the project. The first project is, of course, the floating school. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, so I'll take you through it quite quickly. Um, set in Lagos, uh, one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Uh, Lagos has a population of 16 million people, a very small footprint, and uh, it is said to be um, about 20, 21 million people or 24 million people in 2020. Um, and it's uh, a city surrounded by water. 30% of its surface area is covered by water. Uh, so essentially, um, you know, it's got this fissure that sort of cuts right through the heart of it. Uh, and the red areas that you see there, of course, uh, the settlement. So there's a sort of a unidirectional traffic always going up and down here. Anyone who's been to Lagos knows that it's a nightmare to move from uh, the island, so-called island here, to the mainland. Um, there is uh, an idea to connect the city with a ring road, uh, with a bridge they call the Fourth Mainland Bridge, which we also, uh, in 2008, at OMAI proposed a design with the team. And um, uh, the, by establishing this ring road, actually what really becomes the heart of the city is a body of water. And right in the center of that, right in the heart of that city, is the settlements uh, called Makoko. Uh, Makoko is... Uh, a community that lives on water. It's um, said to be almost 100 years old. Uh, and it's a fishing and sawing industry uh, that basically everyone lives really just on water. It's a basic fundamental building uh, uh, idea of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an urban environment. It has almost no roads, no land in the conventional sense, no uh, modern infrastructure. It's just uh, everyone lives um, on, uh, you know, buildings on stilts. Yeah, like I said, nearly 100,000 people there, uh, you know, almost 20,000 houses, nearly six to eight people per house, uh, and everyone has uh, almost uh, two or more boats, and that's how they get around. So, in a way, I mean, the cities around the world uh, are very, uh, quite similar to Makoko in a, in a different category. So I call Amsterdam, which is also a wonderful city that I, uh, that I, I, I live in, um, a category one water city, where the relationship with water is that, you know, you have buildings, you have a car, you can move around, you can walk, you can drive, and then there's a, a, a canal in the, in the center. Uh, a more extreme condition is uh, a, a category two city, which is Venice, where you can't really drive, you can't really um, cycle, but everyone moves on boats and or you're walking. So there's no other form of transportation. And uh, category three water city uh, is uh, Makoko, which is a lot more extreme, that you, you can't walk, uh, you can't drive, you can't do anything. The only thing you can, you know, buildings, uh, all the buildings are directly in water and you can only get around by boat. And boat, so essentially water is the infrastructure. And you know, there, there are lots of cities like that, not only in, in uh, Lagos, in, in Gambia, in Benin, Benin we found uh, such settlements um, in Senegal, uh, Ghana, and of course in different parts of the world, in Thailand, there are lots of settlements uh, like these. And for me, this is a source to, that actually is an, it, 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 it's, uh, a, it's a view into a possible solution to deal with the issues of uh, climate change and the environment. This is a home in Makoko. It's uh, technically defined uh, as a slum, of course. Um, but what's interesting is that you find that, uh, you know, this person who has everything, seems to have everything he needs. You know, he's got this gentleman, he's got almost five kids running around here. Uh, he's got, you know, that's his bathroom, that's his, uh, uh, you know, kitchen in the background there. He's, you know, he's a boat, he moves around, this is his log of wood. So, you know, even a basic fundamental thing uh, as a home seems to work, but yet um, has a lot of problems. Um, so, I, 
in 2000, this is how people get around in Makoko. This is uh, actually a, a shopping, um, you know, kind of a, a shopping mall. So there, I, I do not mean to romanticize um, an environment like that. We recognize it that there are really challenge, huge challenges. Uh, the quality of housing is poor. Uh, the sanitation is really bad. Um, education um, is uh, lacking, and infrastructure, water supply, they, they really don't have. But you know, I, I, when I started uh, in Lay in 2010, I spoke with the state government officials, and I said, you know, I, I just want to help. I, I'm looking for, tell me what, you, what are your top issues in, in the city. And um, they said, well, housing shortage is a big issue. I said, OK, good. I'm going to research affordable housing. And that's how I started. I was looking around, OK, what is the most, what's the most basic dwelling? What is the most minimal dwelling in the city? And Makoko is a place where people pass by, but they never go into it because it's just that um, slum that you know, is, uh, has a negative um, uh, stereotype. And I, I went there, and I was um, really surprised. I was shocked by what I saw, that people actually live in such an environment. At the same time, I immediately recognized the opportunities. I recognized the fact that uh, almost out of nothing, they were, they've been able to create uh, a, a whole city, you know, that that really is resourceful, that how can that be possible where there's, you know, where the only thing, the only infrastructure they have is water. And yet they've been able to create an industry. This is, uh, you know, they, they use the water to move in logs of wood and create a sawing industry. They have a huge community, all planned out, it seems. But, I, you know, apparently no one, there's no planner there, but it's really extremely organized out of, you know, uh, self, uh, uh, very basic rules. Uh, they have an agricultural practice where they basically put in these reeds and create um, uh, an aquatic um, uh, area, a habitation for fish, and they harvest the fish. Uh, and you know, transportation is, of course, uh, 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 low, low energy. So, um, and, and of course, even from an architectural pers uh, point of view, aesthetics, you know, it's such a beautiful place, the reflection, the light, Water almost makes uh, everything uh, quite beautiful. Um, so I was confronted with uh, a challenge that they had, which is that they had a, a school for, for the kids there. And uh, seasonally, the school gets flooded, and the kids you know, have to deal with this condition. The school is built on reclaimed, a patch of reclaimed land. And um, you know, the foundation of the school, everything is really um, in a poor state. Uh, and um, in addition to that, the, city, the government had started threatening to demolish the community because they just thought, okay, this is, there's no way to deal with this uh, kind of environment that we should, we should just move them. Um, so I began working with um, you know, the community. I, I, the first thing I did was to actually meet with one of the builders who had built several uh, houses all over the, uh, the, the uh, community. And uh, he taught me everything. He really said, okay, look, this is how we build. These are the joints. This is you know, the type of wood. This is what works here. Uh, and you know, we did a lot of documentation. We spoke with the community. And you know, with, with global um, experts and collaborators uh, in the Netherlands and all, in other parts of the world, we're able to come up with um, an idea which was really driven by looking at how they build the local technology, the way that the, the houses are built. So the houses are built on stilts, right? And you know, there's a limitation to the foundation because you can't determine the strength of the soil. Uh, so uh, you know, they basically just have these stilts, one or two floors maximum. Um, and of course, with the increase in rainfall due to climate change, they're getting a lot more uh, occurrences of uh, flooding, and uh, because the b buildings are in a fixed position, they get you know there's nothing they can do, so they do they are um, vulnerable to flooding. So we at some point we realize well you know we should just take out the problem. The issue is the uh, foundation. You know what if you create what if we 
uh, find a solution to create a flotation device, but use the same kind of building material, building technology to, um, so essentially the flotation device allows the building to adapt to the changing sea level, uh, water uh, levels, but um, bring these two ideas together, the local uh, building technique with the um, uh, with a sort of a, a, a global idea to create a, a hybrid, which is um, a, a, a roof structure that sits on a flotation device. And a triangle, it's a, so essentially it's a tri triangular structure, which um, of course the triangle is a very rigid and stable structure that allows, um, uh, that has a low center of gravity. So it's actually the best uh, shape for uh, stability uh, and flotation. And uh, this became the concept for uh, the floating school. And um, it's not just, the idea immediately struck me that, okay, this is not just about a school, it's beyond a school. It's perhaps uh, an idea that can be used for all kinds of uh, solutions. So when, when we began the design, we actually were looking at different uh, possibilities of uh, creating a flotation device you know, should we use a steel barge? Should we use, you know, uh, concrete platform? There, there are different ways of creating flotation, um, uh, floating buildings. But every time, this is the interesting thing, every time we had a challenge um, in the, on the project, you know, I, we, I only had to look around and the solution was there. Uh, the kids have always been, like, playing around on these plastic barrels. And I just thought, wow, well, that's it right there, you know. You have to, you know, I really believe every problem uh, s suggests um, its, its solution, you know. It really is within the, the problem. Um, and again, interesting enough, these plastic barrels are quite popular and common in, in the environment because Lagos is a port city, so, you know, you get all these recycled plastic barrels that are for sale. So, you know, we just strapped a couple together and we, um, put you know, a, a, a platform on it and the kids just jumped right on, on, on top of it and it was almost like home, you know. They were absolutely comfortable with it and um, so we figured, okay, you know, this is, we'll make it modular and multiply this in a way that, you know, because it's such a difficult environment, you, you, we, we didn't want to use heavy equipment. Uh, we had to do something that one or two people could manage or a few people could manage within very tight constraints and on water. And uh, we strapped 16 of these uh, platforms together to create uh, 100 uh, square meters. So it's a 10 by 10 meter platform uh, of a floating real estate, uh, so to speak. And uh, right within the community, again, we you know, looked around and said, okay, well, let's just build a structure uh, with the local material. So everything we got really f was from the environment. And, um, you know, we, that's, the, that's the structure right there. You know, it's almost this sort of weird condition where it looks like sort of emerging from, from, from uh, the, uh, the, the, the wood there. And uh, so we put up the structure and, uh, but before that actually, you know, I, when I had this idea, you know, I, you know it was kind of crazy. And uh, I, you know, I, I decided to do some scientific research and did some Serious testing. Yeah, that's a, that's like a tornado there. But it actually works, you know. So, but uh, so seriously, um, but you know, we also really had um, scientific and um, engineering support from some of the most. Uh, uh, experienced uh, yacht manufacturers, builders in, in the Netherlands, you know, doing calculations of tilt, balance, you know, and, you know, the, when I came up with it, when I, suggest, when I showed them the idea, they were like, oh, that's just perfect, you know, this is, you know, triangle, this, the structure is just perfect, you know, it works um, great, and stability is just uh, great, so, you know, they did all the uh, calculations and, uh, uh, give us a seal of approval and you know we then worked out how to build it uh, using um, a, a system which is essentially uh, a um, 
not necessarily a construction document. We actually had an assembly drawing where all the, all the members were exactly um, uh, cal calculated and we just needed to give the builders uh, from the community a number of um, drawings, uh, sorry, a number of uh, sheets um, and they worked with it. And, uh, you know, this is the structure under construction. Uh, Christmas was even used as a party. So even under construction, it was already useful. And that's how important this has been for them. That they really, the kind of space that they required, the environment was just uh, ideal. So the structure, again, you know, it's a triangular structure. The ground floor is open, used as a public space, a playground for, this, for the kids. Uh, the, the, there's an enclosed space, so there's an open space on the ground floor, an enclosed space and a semi-enclosed space uh, on the top floor. Um, and uh, that's the building. Uh, this is sort of uh, a close-up of uh, how it's used. It's really, um, you know, it's almost like a, a magnet. It really attracts uh, people just from everywhere. And uh, that's, uh, that's it in, in the context. Uh, you know, it's become kind of a landmark for the city, and uh, uh, it's after the after the construction. So I, I when when I when I did, when the design when I, when I came up with the design with the community, and we worked out the solutions, and we we actually pre, we I said to myself, well, you know, I'm going to build this myself. You know, I'm going to I should find some maybe friends who would uh, contribute to it and make it happen, and. Uh, and then it occurred to me that we're actually dealing with a bigger issue of climate change and uh, we, uh, we got a grant from the United Nations to actually build it. So really, again, source of funding, if you understand the issues that were, you know, the sort of the uh, context in which you're operating, what, what your architecture, your design is operating, then the issues of, um, of uh, the economic conditions become also resolved in a way. Um, it's gotten a lot of popularity uh, and international attention. This is CNN, you know, and um, you know it's been all, all over the news. It's uh, and and not particularly because it's uh, something really different or re sorry something really um, like uh, you know it's, it's I don't think it's we've invented the first floating house. No, but I think when you, when you actually consider the fact that um, this was built by. Uh, people within the community, uh, eight or nine men with no, nothing more sophisticated than a hand drill, uh, a, a three, 220 square meter, three floor building uh, in an environment that is so harsh, then maybe there's something to say about that. So, um, but also the fact that, you know, it could be um, replicated quite easily. And uh, I've taken the liberty to uh, um, <laughs> throw it there. Um, so, or, uh, you know, and maybe you can use the wall as an art wall there or something. And for those that like the super sexy uh, version, um, we can also build it in al aluminum. Um, so in, 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 in its environment, it's of course been quite successful. It's, you know, there's a lot of, there are lots of people coming to see the building, tourism, economic opportunities for the community. Uh, these are my, this is my team after a hard day's work, uh, uh, beers and uh, of course even the women, men and women, you know, this is how they sort of use it. It's a really almost a, a building that is alive and again the, 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 the kids still um, float on their plastic barrels and uh, it's one with nature. So the idea is of course that today we have a condition like this and uh, perhaps in the future we can replicate this. It's not only a school, it could be a hospital, it could be your homes, it could be you know, a library, it could be anything. You know, it's basically a new form of architecture, a new form of building uh, and, and living on water that addresses the issues of uh, climate change and also uh, provides, um, uh, uh, um, addresses the issue of uh, urbanization. If they can build so quickly uh, and so cheaply and so um, effectively, and we learn from that environment, then uh, perhaps we can create, find a, it's a key or a, a, an idea into a new solution. Um, and the fact that it could be multiplied, you can create clusters and uh, hopefully uh, develop uh, a, a large co community. 
this is an image we produced, uh, which is uh, at MoMA exhibition in New York. Uh, the idea that a city can sort of emerge into these layers of, uh, you know, of density and, um, you know, from from high, very dense to to sort of more dispersed water conditions. So you have sort of New York here, Amsterdam, Venice, and maybe Makoko at the end. Um, I'll go very quickly to our next project. Our next project is Chikoko, next, uh, Chikoko Radio, which is set in Port Harcourt, uh, which is uh, about 600 kilometers from Lagos in the Niger Delta region. Uh, and it's a very different environment. People are a lot more educated. They, uh, there's a huge oil industry. It's one of the richest oil uh, uh, cities in, in, in the country. Uh, it's an oil and gas uh, field. At the same time, they, there are lots of settlements around a water, around water bodies, you know, informal uh, communities. Uh, and again, for me, the people ha are such uh, a resource. And um, we, in two, I think, two thousand and nine, the the city, the city had this drive to develop, and they started demolishing some of the communities. And they, you know, said, okay, all these areas, the slums will be cleared out for new developments and all of that. And um, so we got this site. This, the, we were asked by uh, an, an organization to come look into providing this intervention in this uh, site, which is also a waterfront community. And um, the, the community actually has a culture of water, but they're not like Makoko. They don't quite live on water. They live by water, and they, they, you know, they have a history uh, I'll just show you a quick video. You see this place where they are? Now, water before. Where our papa, them, come, come down, and fisher people. They come carry this mud, big, big mud, come stone here. As you see this house, it's dead deep, deep inside the ground. All here now, money they take by all here now, mangrove, then cotton, cotton. She go come on, why you have to run, why you have to run, why you have to run. This place where you see so. Now here they born me. Now here, my mama and my papa, Mary stay, born me. And here she died, we carry her, go that way, go bury her. You see, Mr. Donnie, 56 years. These 56 years where I did so, I, know, I never go any other place. I hear. Even another town, I never go to any place. Me, I'm from this place. I don't know whether I'm waiting uh, with the year, whether they want to push us to the way here. We don't know. If they want to carry us to the way, we don't know where to go. Me and my picking them. Yeah, man, what's up, man? Hey, let's sing it. Let's man. Oh, sure. Let's man. Also, how are you? Everything nice, man. Let's 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 Doesn't that just warm your heart? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, you get it, you get called by a community like that, and you just don't say no, right? You just, you know, you you understand that you've got you've got people to work with, and um, 
And that's, that's how I got drawn into Chikoko Radio um, by uh, CMAP, an organization that uh, tried to help the community uh, address and find a voice, you know, create uh, an identity, find, uh, some, create something to an enable them to speak out and to, uh, uh, you know, de develop themselves, you know. Um, and so we looked at what the, how they had lived many years ago starting from, you know, their, they, they've basically been landfilling and moving towards, you know, constantly just landfilling. And now they're thinking, well, you know, we're a waterfront community. We need to be more, we need to really engage water. And uh, so we, we had the site uh, and we, they had uh, uh, a community vote about what they should have, uh, the kinds of facilities they needed in the community. And you would see, uh, you know, so they casted votes with like shells. The community, you know, they had this ring and uh, uh, you see these little things like um, uh, that's a bank, their new bank didn't get much of a vote. I was very, very disappointed. The swimming pool didn't get any. Um, but uh, the radio station got quite a lot and, uh, and that's really how they, we began. Uh, there was a, an extensive mapping um, uh, uh, done by C, the CMAP, the NGO that uh, invited us to work there. Even the, the police, local police, were involved in like identifying the community, like saying, okay, look, this is uh, who lives here. Uh, they began a radio training program. Um, and then, so we looked at all these programs that were required and we put them into this, uh, you know, boxes and said, okay, well, you know, uh, in addition to all of these things, they wanted, uh, uh, they, they needed to be a mast, you know, a 40 meter mast. Uh, and so we worked with the community, looked, asked them, okay, well, you, you, where do you want to locate this building? Do you want it uh, on land? Do you want it uh, half on land, half on water? Do you want it uh, totally on water? And really, you know, because they had seen our school and they were interested in that, and they were like, well, you know, we're not quite a waterfront community, but, you know, we, I think we will settle for uh, being partly on land and partly on water. So that's how they really, through community engagement, they settled for this idea of a building that straddles, just conceptually, for them, it's a bridge between water and land. Um, and the idea is that, you know, instead of developing into the uh, creek that they begin to engage the water along its perimeters with uh, public infrastructure. So we organize all the program into a linear structure, looking at what's public to what's private, to what's open to what's enclosed, and use the masts, uh, you know, uh, activated the mast as, uh, as not, not only as an engineering device, but architecture, to basically suspend the building off the ground because the land, they, you know, they have very scarce land and that's why they keep landfilling. But to then liberate public space underneath the building and by doing that, we also uh, allow the, the building to engage the waterfront to create uh, access uh, uh, to, the water, to the water. And that's really how the building uh, got developed, which is sort of an amphibious uh, building that is uh, both, uh, uh, it's a radio station so you have essentially, conceptually, it's a mast with a program that creates a bridge uh, across. And uh, you know, it's, it's all naturally ventilated, uh, in, except the radio station, which is enclosed. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so that's the entrance, uh, that, that's the approach view, where it's lifted off the ground. Uh, that's the side view. Um, it, it's a jetty, you know, it's a market space. Uh, it's a cinema space, um, a public infrastructure, and again, it's really about people. It's really about how people engage space, engage an environment, uh, and how essentially for us, we re realize that you must identify, you must understand what people do and also understand the environment as a, as, a, as a very important factor. And the relationship between people and an environment is uh, key to uh, the future of uh, architecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>